All right, well, welcome. We are bringing you, uh, I think it's episode eight already of our Career Speaker Series. We have a very exciting panel of safety experts. We're going to be hearing from the NTSB, uh, two airlines, and the FAA. So we're very excited that you're here to join us, and they're going to be talking about uh, their careers. All are UND alums, so we're very proud uh, to host them uh, this afternoon. So without further ado, I think I'm going to start introducing. We've got Adam Gerhardt with the NTSB. We have Vanya uh, Volskarinski with Southwest Airlines, Steph Raley from Sun Country Airlines, and Corey Stevens uh, with the FAA. So without further ado, because I want to make sure that they have time to present uh, their amazing uh, slides that they've created for us, uh, we'll pass it over. Adam, you're going to be up first. Perfect, Beth. Well, hey, thank you. And it is a, uh, a, a true honor to be here on the panel and to, to be back talking to uh, UND students. I, uh, I guess it feels like I haven't been back in, in a, a little while, but it, it hasn't been too long. But <clears throat> I hope today that I can at least share a little bit about my background and tell you about the NTSB, what our mission is, what we do, what air safety investigators do, because I know when I was sitting in your shoes, um, I, I uh, did. <laughs> it was never something I thought I'd be doing. Uh, and really didn't have a good understanding of, of what role the NTSB plays in aviation safety. So um, just, just to, as you can see the slide there, uh, my background, uh, 2008 grad uh, from UND, and I went on to become uh, a flight instructor and uh, a great experience. I had about uh, three years of UND flight instructor experience. Uh, from there, I moved on. Um, to the regional airline pilot route under U.S. Airways Express, uh, Air Wisconsin, and flew the CRJ-200, which was an incredible experience, uh, something that I feel like uh, UND just does a great job just uh, preparing you for an airline career. But for me, I was based in the D.C. metro area and always had an interest in getting into government work um, and uh, interest in human factors, which uh, I know is uh, becoming ever more popular in um, uh, in aviation, but uh, so I was able to move into an FAA contractor role doing human factors work and did that for about two years. And then finally, I uh, ended up uh, was in the right place at the right time and applied for a uh, entry level air safety investigator position with the NTSB. And I have been uh, at the board since 2015. So um I am from Columbus, Ohio. I've got uh, two kids and one more on the way. So my household uh, with all the work at home is a little bit, uh, a little bit interesting, uh, like most people these days. Um, so that's, that's my background. Again, the, the common theme there really is uh, I, I'm more of a, a pilot background. We do have some investigators that hold more of a maintenance background or an air traffic control background. But for me, uh, like many investigators, I can get a little bit more into that down the road, but uh, uh, it is more of a, a pilot background. But uh, Beth, if you go to the next slide, so th this is the this is the really high level snapshot. What is the NTSB, and what do air safety investigators do? And so, <clears throat> the NTSB is an independent federal agency, and what that means is the NTSB is not under any other agency. We do not report to the FAA. Uh, we do not report to the Department of Transportation. We are our own agency within the executive branch and giving us that independence, which is, which is key as you'll see later as our primary uh, job is issuing safety recommendations to the uh, to various industries. But uh, again, at a high level, so if we've got five board members those board members are responsible for adopting the reports that staff members, such as myself, that we prepare and they vote on the factual report, the analysis, the cause, the recommendations. And so at a very high level, that's the, that's the upper echelon of the, uh, of the NTSB and the board. There's five board members. Um, and we investigate each, every civil aircraft accident in the United States. And so we do not pick and choose what accidents we'll investigate. If it meets the damage criteria or there are serious injuries, 
or fatalities, we will investigate every single accident in the United States. And so that's quite, it's quite a, uh, quite a charge uh, that we've been given. And that results in about 1,200 to 1,500 accidents every year. And of those accidents, roughly 120, uh, 150 are fatal accidents. Those are the accidents that, of course, get the most attention. And those are the accidents that we launch to or travel to. And so in my role as an air safety investigator, we call it the investigator in charge, the IIC, will lead that investigation. And um, we use a party member process um, to conduct those investigations. An air safety investigator may also, for a larger investigation, you may serve as a group chairman, we call it. So you may lead one particular component of an investigation, looking at maybe the pilot actions or maybe the airworthiness of the aircraft. And so we'll divide up for a larger investigation, you may be assigned into one small segment. Um, and we also do uh, the bottom line there, US accredited representatives for, for investigations. So when there are uh, US products that uh, are involved in accidents abroad, we want to know if there's safety issues, even though that action, accident may have happened in Italy or in Brazil. And so we do get involved there and, uh, and work with the foreign counterparts. Um, Beth, can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, again, this is, um, this is a high level slide, but this is the big picture of what is the purpose our, of our investigation. And I think the, really the key takeaway here is the, the whole purpose of our investigation, of course, you see facts, conditions, circumstances, and the probable cause. But the whole point of it is for safety. It's not for uh, um, punitive actions to regulate, fine, jail people, uh, or to take pilot certificates away. The NTSB has no power to do any of those things. And so it's, it's strictly um, an agency that is independent to produce the facts, uh, conditions, circumstances, of probable cause, and a really high level of uh, what every investigation will tell you if you've watched uh, the air crash shows. And uh, it, it's never one, uh, it's never one thing that causes an accident. It is very cliche, but uh, the, the air chain is real. And it's what our investigations reveal time and time again. And you can see uh, the Swiss cheese model of uh, sometimes the, the, the hole is just a line, and those areas are what our investigation really are trying to seek out and hopefully implement um, barriers so that those holes won't line up again. And so between the, the Swiss cheese model, the air chain, uh, facts, conditions, circumstances, very high level, that, that is what our investigation um, is, uh, is meant to do. And I think you can go to the next slide. This is my... Um, so this is a common question. Uh, how do I become an NTSB investigator? And so at the bottom there, I've gotten a green box. I want to very uh, clearly stress there is no one path to becoming an NTSB investigator. There are typical qualifications. And as you can see, um, commercial pilot, um, instrument rating, 1,000 total time, uh, medical, uh, undergraduate degree, and experience inside and outside the flight deck. Those are typical qualifications that will set you up to be headed in the right direction. If it is your dream to work at the NTSB, um, that is, you know, I, I always want to put out something objective for someone who may be interested in down the road in their career. Well, he, here, here's some objective standards that our job announcements typically have. I want to stress though, the, the one issue with the NTSP is um, it, it's, good and, it's good and bad, but we are a very, very small federal agency. There's about 60 investigators like me and a total of 100 in the Office of Aviation Safety. Um, and as comparison, there's about four to 5,000 FAA inspectors. Now, of course, their mission is much more broad than ours. But again, just, just note that uh, a lot of people are very surprised to know how small we are 
Um, and, and that is a challenge because there, there, are, there are not that many uh, uh, job openings out there. Um, but one of the things that, that you can do is uh, go to USA Jobs and subscribe to NTSB openings and look for the jobs that we're posting. Look at the criteria um, that we are announcing for. And one of the things that I um, re remember this recently, um, it was about two to three years before the NTSB hired me. And I saw, I, I had the job filter set up through USA Jobs for NTSB jobs. And I saw this uh, this investigator position pop up with the NTSB and I, and I hadn't seen too many job openings in the past. And I looked at that and I saved the job announcement. I said, I don't have, I, I don't have a lot of those, um, those items on, <laughs> on the job announcement. I'm going to work to, to at least get some of them. Uh, one of the things I did was I went and got a master's in human factors. And so, um, that, that maybe that's something that helped, uh, certainly not a requirement, but uh, it, just seeing that announcement for that job and having something to at least work towards to build, to build that um, building block in my resume, uh, it, was, it was something nice to see. So go to USA Jobs, look at some of the job announcements, uh, at least see what's, uh, what's, what you could at least work for. Um, and the next slide, if we could wrap it up. Um, so, you know, it's pretty, it's not a common slide. I think uh, maybe a lot of us will have, but just learn, learn. It's a good way to learn more about the NTSB. It's not just through different news articles you see about, um, accidents, but, uh, actually follow directly from us so going to our website, um, uh, Twitter, actually, we have, uh, the NTSB newsroom there. Actually, you can see Every time we are launching or there's a new fatal accident, we will be tweeting about it and at least at least letting uh, letting the public know we are investigating. So you can start to see um, uh, how <laughs> unfortunately you can start to see how how common uh, accidents are. And it's a good I feel like it's a good way to get plugged in. Uh, we do have a podcast. I I did one of the episodes uh, about a year ago and it was a great experience and um, there's a lot of different uh, uh, ways to to get plugged into us. So um, I can't wait to get to the questions. And that's all that I had for my slides. So thank you, Beth. Thank you, Adam. And up next, we have Vanya from Southwest Airlines. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. My name, again, is Vanya. I'm a safety management system business consultant for flight operations at Southwest Airlines. I graduated UND with the aviation management program. I used Colgate Total for my toothpaste this morning. I just switched from the iPhone world to Pixel 4a. So we're all going through the same stuff. Um, uh, that all just show that we all love to work. We all love aviation. Um, we're all equals. Uh, what I do in my spare time is what sets me apart, I think, is I volunteer with the Minnesota Boy Choir. You can see that on the picture on the bottom left-hand side. And I love that Southwest supports me with that. The, uh, but, you know, you can't do much of that during the pandemic. Uh, so there's a group of employees that uh, I joined a little club um, that transports rescue animals. So you can see the middle pictures there. That's a little kitten named Sweet Potato. And uh, it was a rescue that needed to get to from Atlanta to Charleston. So uh, had a great ride with uh, Sweet Potato a couple weeks ago. Uh, when there's not a pandemic going on, I love to travel. You can see me on the jump seat there. Uh, and uh, But usually I'm, I'm based in Dallas and a little picture of our headquarters. Looking more specifically at what I do on the next slide, uh, SMS business consultant uh, is, is focused on SMS. Uh, when you started your aviation career, you picked up the very thick book of the FAR AIM, which is split into two parts. The FAR focusing on the rules and the regulations and then the AIM providing that guidance. Uh, well, same thing for SMS. I mean, you're focused on part 91 right now. My SMS is all in part five. And so we've got a thick book of rules and regulations of part five, everything you need for an SMS. And then uh, 
guidance within our advisory circular, which is filled with tons of legal language and flowcharts with arrows pointed in every which direction. That's probably not exciting for many people to read every single day, much less make a business out of it. But the cool thing about SMS is that although you're told what you need to do by the FAA, you get to decide how you're gonna do that. And that's where that creativity that I enjoy steps in. So I come in as a consultant to create tools to make that flow chart look a little bit more exciting. And that's where you can see the SRM column from that uh, uh, into that blue dashboard that you see on the right hand side where it says hazard title and then you've got your risks on there. It makes it a lot more easier for leaders and other stakeholders to understand what you're doing with SMS. But you, of course, need to know the background of that, too. So with my role, there's a lot of training that I do, a lot of presenting in front of leadership, VP, including our COO. But I would say a majority of my time is spent with my fellow analysts that are looking at the data because we are a data-informed culture. You can see kind of one of that uh, example spreadsheet, uh, I'm sorry, an example graph of a trend increasing. And once it's over a certain threshold, you know, there's some action that you're gonna have to do. Again, something that I enjoy about safety management system is that everything's already kind of plotted and you get to just, you just kind of press the green light and you go um, because you know what to do when there's an increasing trend. So that way you can be proactive and use that data in a predictive way to manage risk. So in the, uh, you know, one of the, highest risks that we have right now in our organization is the MAX aircraft. The risks associated with that are at a level so high that we cannot operate that aircraft. Now that we came out with controls, we mitigated that high risk, which is way too high, to something that's as low as reasonably possible or acceptable. And now that that risk is mitigated, we can operate that aircraft, we're introducing it back into our service. And a lot of that risk work is kind of done behind the scenes. So as a pilot, you don't get to see that stuff. That's something that I realized when, during my internship uh, with ExpressJet back in the day. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, I was jump seating on a flight deck and I was like, oh, well, as a pilot, you're doing the same thing um, to ensure the safety of flight. But I, I always wanted to know the picture of why you're doing the flow why is the flow designed the way that it is? Why are you, uh, why is the QRH or QRC built out in this way? And so uh, the big picture was definitely more available from a more headquarters perspective. And uh, a lot of folks, you know, they think desk job, well, then you're a pencil pusher. That's your decision. You get to decide if you're going to be a pencil pusher or if you're going to be part of change and management. And that's where I really enjoy. I've made my personal decision that I'm not going to be a pencil pusher. I like to create exciting tools. I like to train um, and I like to talk through things to figure out what's the best next steps. On the next slide, uh, we've got a couple examples of all the roles that we have within the safety department. Uh, I started as a specialist, got promoted to an analyst after some time, and now I'm in a business consultant role. Um, but my manager's manager's manager, 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 so on and so forth, it goes up the chain of flight operations, meaning that my safety department is specific to pilots. I'm not worried so much about flight attendants, ground operations, or our mechanics and tech ops. I'm worried about pilots because I have pilot background. Uh, although I never flew a commercial aircraft, um, I still have the bit, you know, I've got my commercial multi. And so I kind of, you know, can speak the same language and can come from the same empathetic understanding of things. Well, we need that at the analyst level, folks that are playing with data. An example of four different programs that we have within flight ops safety is our Aviation Safety Action Program or ASAP. Similar to what you have in, at UND, you have a voluntary reporting program. If ever you identify a hazard or if you, know, you made a mistake and you, you need to tell someone, well, you would submit a report. For an airline that flies pre-pandemic about 4,000 flights a day, that's over a million flights a year. We've got thousands of reports that we uh, sift through and each report has its own story. It needs to be reviewed and we need to learn from that. Not so we can just you know, tell the pilot, you know, give them resources to prevent the issue from reoccurring, but we as an organization need, there's a lesson to be learned from our end every single time. So we need 
pilot background folks who have this education who are interested in perhaps narratives or, uh, or, or reading through reports and doing their mini investigations to be part of that program. We also have a fatigue risk management program, which looks at uh, the way that the schedule is built and the way that it's operated. How often are we putting a, uh, creating schedules that are fatiguing for our pilots? We're looking at circadian rhythms. We're looking at uh, sleep modeling, all these great things to ensure that, you know, what I can do from the safety department is I can't just turn to you as the pilot and say, be better and expect you to be better, right? But what I can do is build, is frame that environment around you to get the best out of you. I know the, the great potential that you as a pilot has, and I want only the best out of it. So let me do my part to give, to make your job easier for you. Um, if that involves creating a better schedule, at least we can go and research that. Uh, as Adam talked about, we, you know, from the investigation side, there are some investigations that we conduct internally. And even if there's an NTSB uh, reportable event, then generally there's an investigator from the airline that supports that investigation for the NTSB. Uh, that being said, plenty of things that we wanna learn from if ever there's an event that occurs uh, and, and we need that expertise in-house. Last but not least, our flight data analysis program uh, is kind of the black box team uh, in which, uh, you know, our digital flight data access unit, so our fake black box for the MAX aircraft captures 1,600 parameters per second. That's a lot of data. And so there's a lot of lessons learned from that data. We need a team of analysts, but also if you have like a computer background, that's an awesome team for you because uh, we've got data architects and engineers, computer science majors, and aviation background analysts to sift through all that data so we get, uh, uh, so we can, again, use our data re less reactive and more proactive and predictive. Once these programs have figured out what data they're looking at and have determined the events or uh, identified an increasing trend, that's where I step in and I will help them do something with that. I'll guide them through the process of, okay, we need to get these people involved. We need to perform a root cause analysis so we can determine what's the best way to fix the problem rather than slapping a Band-Aid on it. I get excited about those solutions because we kind of get a little bit philosophical, we get in depth and we really get creative. Um, and away from the traditional, well, someone in the room's like, well, let's just, you know, tell everyone to be better and then hope things change. Well, we've matured past that. Um, and that's where I get passionate about safety management systems for sure. Um, I am probably out of time, but we can get back to it if we want. But um, uh, there are plenty of resources on campus. So I graduated UND and I came in straight to Southwest. I'm very lucky in that regard and I'm blessed to share that story. But the only way I was able to do that was by using resources at UND. Uh, and I'll, I'll go through them very quickly, but just remember, you know, you have that campus, uh, your career services office. Uh, ever since my freshman year, I would review my resume with them every single year. I actually continue as a graduate and an alum, I continue to use them as a resource to make sure that my resume is competitive. Uh, I would go to every career fair every single year. So there's three of them, two done by career services, one done by SAMA. Airlines go and visit each one. So go shake hands, make yourself known. Of course, they're hiring pilots, but you can say, what else you got? What kind of internships do you have outside of flight operations or outside of the pilot world? We've got standards, we have training, we have safety, um, and they're looking for uh, individuals like that as well. I started writing letters to each person that I got a business card from just so they remember my name. So that way, by the time it was my junior, senior year, um, you know, I would see the repeated faces and they'd be like, hey, I remember you. I still got nothing for you, but I, you know, I, I remember you and I remember asking this and that. Um, and we would just have that conversation. Other services offered by them include the Dress for Success seminar. You may know what you believe is professional, but you might as well have that validated by going through the Dress for Success seminar. Uh, and uh, they had a dining etiquette event. I love food. So it was just an excuse to eat uh, dinner, but you kind of get to, uh, you, you get your questions answered of, hey, let's say you're off on a business lunch and, you know, your boss turns to you and say, how about you pick the appetizers? 
it may be easy for you to say mozzarella sticks, but what are some things that you can think about, you know, from an etiquette standpoint of what makes sense best for uh, a business lunch? Talk to your professors because they have networked more than any of us have because they continue to keep up with their students. Uh, and last but not least, market yourself. So say hi, reach out to any of us as panelists after today's discussion, just with an email with a question, um, so we can start that conversation. So we know who you are, so we can hire you in the future or direct you uh, and provide that guidance. Um, but if, if you don't reach out to us, we, we won't be able to support you. And I know we're all here because we want you to succeed. So thank you very much uh, for, the, uh, for the time. Thanks for having me and uh, we'll go to Steph. All right, thanks Vanya. And up next we have Steph Raley, Director of Safety at Sun Country Airlines. Hello, I'm so happy to get to follow Vanya because he did such an awesome job of explaining SMS and it's a great uh, tie into my role here. So um, I'm Steph Raley, I'm a 99 grad of UND, majored in commercial aviation, got all my certificates at UND through the CFII. Uh, and it was my goal to be a commercial airline pilot at that was when I was sitting in Aviation 100, that's what was on my brain. Certainly um, never had career aspirations to be a director of safety, but here I am. So I just wanted to share with you how I got here and what, what I actually do. Um, so you'll see in front of my title, it says 119 director of safety. And so I just wanted to start quickly with what is it? What is a 119 position? So for uh, part 121 carriers, so providing the scheduled service, the regulations actually say there are five positions, management personnel that are required for operations under part 121. And so the, the director of safety is one of those required positions. So I have great job security because in order to be in business, we have to have a director of safety. I mean, if you look down below to paragraph D, people who serve in these positions uh, must be qualified through training, experience, and expertise, and have a full understanding of aviation safety standards and safe operating practices, the FARs, and then the operations specifications or OPSECs as they are known. So through my uh, career at UND, and then also through my professional career, those are the little nuggets that you just keep adding into your bucket. So that's what a 119 position is. How did I get the job? Um, I was tapped on the shoulder here at Sun Country, uh, and I can get into more detail from that, but just because Sun Country I uh, decided I should be the director of safety. I also had to be interviewed by the FAA for this position as well. And so the FAA says that there's um, certain operational experience and professional qualifications that a director of safety should have. So knowledge and understanding of safety programs, safety standards, and safe operating practices. A director of safety should have one of the following, either a commercial pilot certificate or an ATP which I have a commercial certificate uh, or a mechanic certificate or dispatcher certificate. So those are some options. And then finally, um, they are looking for experience uh, with a supervisory position. So this is a leadership role, um, working with lots of different teams in the airline and managing a team of people. So having that uh, leadership experience um, is what's required. So that's what you need to be a director of safety. On the next slide, just a little bit of a, a background of how I got here. As I said, my career goal was to be a commercial airline pilot. I actually started with Northwest Airlines right out of UND. Um, and as Vanya said, shout out to Career Services. Career Services got me uh, hooked up with an internship with UND, which or excuse me, with Northwest, which led to my first job. So I started teaching on the 747-200. That's the picture on the right there. Actually, um, they got me qualified in all three seats, the flight engineer, the right seat, and the left seat. So I got to fly that airplane 
uh, not in revenue service, but in Part 91 test and ferry. Um, and then I went to the A320, did the same thing on the, that airplane. Uh, and then my career kind of changed. Instead of going in the commercial pilot route, I started to get into um, management roles too. So you can see some of the different companies that I worked for, um, Aerosim, GE, Aviation, Endeavor Air, and then most recently at Sun Country. When I came to Sun Country, I started in the pilot training and flight standards department. Uh, and then that led me into the role here as director of safety. And actually how I really got involved with safety uh, is there's a program called ASAP, the Aviation Safety Action Program, where employees can voluntarily submit reports and the promise is that there's no punitive action taken to them if they make a mistake. Um, there's an event review committee comprised of a company representative, a union representative, and an FAA rep. And those, uh, the ERC meets and reviews all the reports and decides um, what, what the outcome is. And so that's how I really got involved with uh, safety that led me into my role here as the director of safety. On the next slide, um, just wanted to give you a kind of a glimpse of what our safety organization looks like at Sun Country. And th this is different across every airline, depending on size. Um, Sun Country, we are a small airline, so we have 42 airplanes, 1,600 employees as compared to Southwest Airlines, which is just exponentially larger. So um, in my role as director of safety, I report directly to the CEO, which is our accountable executive. Um, so I have a direct line to him. If I have any concerns, I can go straight to him. But administratively, I report to our chief operating officer, um, and he and I coordinate every single day. On my team at Sun Country, we decided to set up uh, really focused. So we, be, we view safety as a partnership, right? We're a support organization. So Vanya supports uh, flight operations at Southwest. I have a manager of flight ops safety here. So he supports flight operations. Um, and then we also have a manager that covers in-flight safety maintenance safety, ground operations safety. I have a manager of FOQA, so that's the black box world. We download and analyze all of the digital flight data looking for trends and significant events. And then I have a manager of SMS who kind of ties us all together and holds us accountable for our processes. So my team, because we are a small, very lean airline, um, each person on my team wears several hats. So the manager of flight ops safety, he runs our ASAP program. He also runs our fatigue risk management program. Uh, and he's working with flight operations on uh, um, safety assurance and safety risk mitigation. So he's doing audits, IEP audits, working with uh, flight operations to conduct safety risk assessments. So we're busy, but it's great. And I will say um, in the director of safety role, the reason I really love this role is because you get to see a broad picture of the entire airline. Although my background was specific to flight operations, I have learned so much uh, because I need to understand the in-flight world, all of the regs and um, inner workings of how the flight attendants uh, interact and maintenance. I learned so much about maintenance and even ground operations, both above wing uh, at the gates where they're processing the passengers and below wing on the ramp uh, where they're loading bags and pushing back the airplanes. So lots to learn. I'm learning every single day, uh, but I have an awesome team of people to help me. So on the next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we do um, and what my oversight is responsible for. And I kind of tried to make some bubbles so you can see um, how I'm devoting my time every day. So we talked about the Aviation Safety Action Program. 
Um, we have an ASAP program in flight ops, in flight and maintenance. We do not have one in ground ops yet, but that's something we'll go to. Um, IEP is the uh, audit program. So it's kind of a quality assurance. We're looking at each department, making sure that we're doing what we say we do. Uh, fatigue risk management programs, we have that for flight ops, in flight, uh, maintenance, as well in scheduling. I'm responsible for the health and safety of all our employees. So OSHA types of considerations. Uh, the VDRP is the voluntary disclosure reporting program. So if we make an error as a company, we disclose that to the FAA. Um, SMS, I'm responsible for our dangerous goods or hazmat. Emergency response is a big piece, uh, planning and pre preparing for emergencies. And then the uh, piece none of us plan for is COVID and that um, has been taking up a very significant part of my life for the last nine months. <laughs> Uh, and then real quickly, I know I'm out of time too because my timer is going off. I just want to show you some examples of the date long there. No, thank you. Very interesting. So we've heard from the NTSB. We've heard from two different airlines that you can see their extensive safety. Now we have Mr. Corey Stevens, who's with the FAA. So Corey. Good morning. Um, so usually the, uh, the Darth Vader theme plays in the background. They introduce the FAA. So thanks, thanks for not, thanks for not playing that. Um, yeah, and Adam did a great job of 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 of, of discussing the the NTSB's role in acts investigation. Um, the FAA plays a plays a part too. NTSB and the FAA are the two organizations that are required by law to uh, investigate an accident. Um, but there's also, if you're interested, lots of other ways to um, to get in, to, to get involved in safety or accident investigation. So for me, uh, yeah, currently with the FAA, prior to that, for about 11 years, I was with the Airline Pilots Association in engineering acts investigation. Um, prior to that, United Airlines Flight Safety, uh, I, was, I actually got to be United's first FOCA analyst. And really, I was just warming the chair for Brandon Wild, who took the job after I left. Uh, what you'll find is aviation is a small world. Aviation safety is even a smaller world. And when you get into some of the subsets like accident investigation, it becomes an even a smaller, smaller subset. And you'll bump into people um, throughout your career that you've, you've met or, or worked with in, in, uh, in previous roles. And then even before that, um, and I'll talk a little bit later about that is, you know, some of the things you can do to spice up your resume. Um, I was a co-op uh, student at, at the NTSB um, back in the nineties. Um, but it's those, some of those co-ops and internships are great ways to, to kind of get your, get your feet wet. Um, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the kind of the acts investigation, uh, idea, um, uh, we talked, uh, um, Adam discussed earlier, NTSB has a role, FAA has a role, but if you are interested in something like accident investigation, you're, you're, you're not, you not only do you, uh, are those, are those your only, uh, your options, but a good portion of the industry, um, has an accident investigation, um, um, accident investigators or even an accident investigation section, the manufacturers, whether it's airframe, whether it's uh, power plant, um, Components, you know, the folks that talk about uh, to get your, your feet wet. For us, the FAA, um, yeah, if you're having trouble hearing me, tell me. I'm very sorry. We were having a terrible windstorm up here today, so our, uh, our, um, okay, cool. Uh, our uh, some of our connections are a little, a little, a little loose today. Um, but yeah, the FAA. Our, our mission is to uh, provide the safest, most efficient aerospace system in the world. Um, when you compare us to other countries, we do a pretty good job. Um, you know, uh, when you look at things like general aviation and, you know, part 135, part 129 operations, um, we have a very robust system here in the United States. And uh, on GA, we, we have probably some of the, um, some of the um, um, most open skies um, that there are. Um, 
the FAA workforce is very diverse. So you don't have to come into the FAA to be an inspector or to be an investigator. Um, we have attorneys, we have accountants, we have um, media communications folks. Um, it's a, we are, and unlike the NTSB, we're a little bit larger, um, but there's a, a ton of different opportunities that are there. So whatever your interest is, you can probably find a, a, a link. It's a, it's, a, it's a very effective way to find a, a connection uh, to maybe a passion in aviation to another passion you have, whether that's in data analysis or um, uh, programming um, um, space. We have commercial space ops now. Um, air transport, uh, uh, air traffic control. Um, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different uh, potential jobs. And like Adam said, uh, always check out USA uh, Jobs um, to uh, to get the most um, um, up to date um, uh, listings that uh, that there are. Um, Beth, I think I lost the the. Uh, there we go. Thanks. Sorry. Um, so in the group I'm with is uh, accident investigation and prevention. So we're not flight standards. We don't, uh, we, don't, um, um, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't issue you know, letters of investigation or anything like that. We get involved if you bend it, burn it, or break it, or want to learn how to keep from bending, burning, or breaking it. Um, that's our, our primary uh, goal. So a lot of what we do on our, on my, on my side is uh, we support government industry safety initiatives. Um, so things, if you've ever heard of the Commercial Aviation Safety Team or the Joint uh, General Aviation Joint Steering Committee, all that work is, is uh, primarily out of our shop. We do the care and feeding for those groups. Uh, we've helped stand up the U.S. Helicopter Safety Team, which is kind of following the same process of CAST and the GAGSC, and also the UAST, the Unmanned Aircraft Safety Team. Now, uh, also a very important um, um, part, uh, uh, component that we do is uh, we also um, support uh, the Aviation Safety Information Information Analysis and Sharing Program, or SIAS. A lot of the programs that you heard uh, Vanya and Steph discuss, um, FOQA, ASAP, all those different safety programs, all come together in a SIAS. So as a community, we can look for risks and mitigate those risks before they become something more, more serious. So CAS began its work in 1997. Um, we had you know, two very significant uh, aviation accidents. We had TW800 and, and ValueJet. Um, at that time, the, the, the accident with the growth of aviation and the, and, the, and the growth and the increase in the accident rate, if it were to continue, the estimate was we would, we would lose an airliner, airline type uh, of, of, of aircraft somewhere in the world about every, every month. Um, so something had to be done. So rather than start a bunch of different safety initiatives where we would have difficulty manning all those, we decided as a community to focus on one single safety initiative, which became CAST. Uh, and the mandate of that was to reduce the fatal accident rate by 80% by 2008. They completed that work. They did a great job. Uh, they actually, uh, I think, lowered the fatal accident rate by about 82, 83%. When the work was completed, they had to decide whether to disband or continue. They decided since we've got the, uh, all the pieces in place, we should continue. And that's really where ASIAS came out. So ASIAS brings in um, data from FOCA programs, ASAP programs. The FA brings in about a 140 different data uh, 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 systems into the, into the process. And we use those, those, all those data together to try to find what could be the next potential risk or the next um, uh, potential um, fatal accident. Um, we uh, develop mitigations and uh, keep those from occurring. In fact, we're, we're the point now, I think we've had our first 22 mitigations that have been built purely off incident. data. So no, no loss of um, but it's, uh, it's based off that data, but it's all those programs like Steph and, and Vanya were discussing uh, that go into those. Um, next. So like I said, my duties include, um, I, I chair the safety analysis team of the GAGSC. Uh, we're, the, we're the worker bees uh, that, uh, that kind of keep um, um, everything running. Um, so for, for what CAS did for commercial aviation, uh, GAGSC, we're, we're working to do the same thing for general aviation. And as you know, general aviation is, is all over the map. That's everything from a, a BBJ or a Gulfstream 650 down to someone who builds a kit box in their garage. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a challenge. Um, so CAST, uh, you know, we, we, were, we were very successful. 
Um, using that same methodology, we've uh, we've been we've been making our targets in general aviation. So a lot of the things that you see uh, coming out now that are battling things like loss of control, um, engine issues, CFIT, um, a lot of those that, that you've seen recently have come out of the, the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee. Uh, we also coordinate between AVP 100, which are our field investigators, which are the folks that uh, Adams uh, folks work with regularly, and 230. So if there's a, a tie in between an accident and a mitigation or something that's been developed in the past, we kind of help help them understand that. And then we will, um, as needed, um, dispatch with, with our 100 folks um, on, on accidents as needed. Have you guys lost Corey as well? <laughs> so, probably they were having some technical difficulties with. Yeah, we're also trying to keep our, our uh, launch like I used to that investigation, um, representing um, the kind of the, the flight ops the flight ops side, um, much like uh, for for Steph and Vanya, they would support from the for the investigation from the company side, uh, depending on, on on what was needed on the investigation. So. Um, like I said, there's, there's, um, it's fascinating. Um, I highly, highly recommend, um, if, uh, if, uh, if someone is going to be making a speech or doing a, um, uh, a visit someplace, we kind of help out with the, uh, with the, with the, uh, communications with them. You never really know where your career is going to take you. So that, that middle picture there where you see the, the, um, 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 uh, the fire truck with the folks on top. I'm, I'm the guy on the far left. So the funny part is, and this is the connection. So Adam had a picture of an aerial shot from behind of an MD-10 looking forward with a, uh, um, with a, um, 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 no, you have to forgive me. I'm, I've got quarantine brain. Um, a uh, slide that was deployed. I think that photo was taken by us during this investigation as we were documenting. We were part of the uh, airworthiness group and we were doing some, some photos. So it, that's the kind of that small world thing we we're talking about. Uh, go ahead, next one. But like I said, you, you, you have no clue where your career is gonna take you and, and don't think that safety is gonna you know, stick you in a, in a box someplace. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll have lots of opportunities to, uh, to, to do a lot of different things, visit a lot of different places. Um, when I was sitting in your seat, like I said, I never planned on being a safety guy, but the way the industry worked out, and I, have, I happened to take a, a, an accident course. And I said, I'd really like to do that for a living. And luckily, I was, I was able to do that. So everything I did course, coursework wise and uh, internship wise, um, I just aimed towards safety and, and followed that path. And with that, I'll, I will I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Well, again, thank you to all the panelists. A lot of great, uh, great information in those presentations. We will open it up. We've got a few minutes for a Q&A. So if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, type those in. One quick one I saw, some of the students are asking about getting in contact with you. Uh, is it safe to assume that most of you are on LinkedIn and would that be the best way for them to reach out to you? Looks like Vanya and Steph are, I know Corey is, Adam. Yep, so students, I, I would encourage you, remember how Mr. Malat showed us how to use LinkedIn to find alum out there? Uh, feel free to look these individuals up that way and that's probably a great way to make that connection. I'm gonna combine some of the questions uh, into this one. What kind of advice would you have for a student in the aviation program at UND right now uh, to do during the next you know, four years or until they graduate to set them up for a successful career possibly in aviation safety? So I'm not sure who wants to take a stab at that one first. Looks like Vanya does. I'll start. Uh, so get involved uh, and start documenting what you do. Uh, I think one of the worst things about applying for any airline is that you have to remember everything you've done for the last 10 years as part of your background check. But at the same time, uh, you have to uh, take the opportunity to document all the extracurriculars that you're a part of. Show what we know you're a pilot, you know, be, and we know you're a good pilot because you uh, graduated UND. But what about you is worth hiring, right? And it's gonna be those extra things. Show me that you're a great leader. Show me that you volunteer. Show me that you, uh, how you spend your time outside outside of the classroom. Even if it's 
engaging, doing more aviation type stuff. That I think that's what sets you apart. Um, and and so get involved if you're if you're not involved yet, but also document and take pictures and uh, be be ready to share your story and start sharing your story now. Steph, what do you think? Yeah, I, w- I would say um, do an internship if you can, and then ask questions. You know, at Sun Country, I'm trying to get an internship program established here, but if there's something that you would want to learn more about or observe. If you just reach out, we have so many UND alum here and say, hey, I'm interested in learning more about this. Can I attend as one of your meetings? You know, we use Zoom and Teams and things like that. You would always be welcome because sometimes just observing and watching, you can get a feel right away of like, ooh, I don't like this at all. Or wow, that was super interesting. I want to learn more. So, Yeah, I think we're going now. Yeah, I can I can piggyback off that. I definitely want to beat the uh, the internship drum. The NTSB uh, has investigator internships for the summers, and uh, I know uh, just a few, just about two years ago, a, a UND student uh, got got one of those internship positions. So um, definitely consider that. The other thing is, um, you know, I, I remember when I was a student, I was so driven on my logbook, my hours every month you know, just, you know, every day totaling up going, how, how much closer am I to whatever the minimums were? Um, at that time, it was about a thousand hours or so. Um, but don't be afraid to, um, you know, the supervisor of flight operations, uh, positions or, you know, those, um, d- down the road, of course, but I don't, I don't know if the language has changed or not, but opportunities that are outside of the cockpit, um, try to seek those out um, and don't look at them as, you know, well, this isn't, you know, this is doing nothing for my logbook. How is this helping me? Um, those opportunities in, in my past uh, have been some of the most um, fruitful, beneficial things that I have is, was my experience outside of the flight deck versus getting another type rating and whatnot. And those things of course are valuable. Don't want to downplay it, but um, don't be so heavily focused on uh, of the uh, of, of building flight time. You know, even though that is important. Some great advice. Okay, I'm going to combine some other questions. A lot of uh, questions dealing uh, with aircraft accidents or incidents. How does the you know the organizations work together? So we have the NTSB, we have the FAA, we have the actual airline. Those other players that come in. How does that work? How do you guys work together in these serious situations? Uh, Beth, I could I could at least start. Um, so so the NTSB, let's just say for a uh, you know unfortunately it's a maybe it's a fatal accident. The NTSB is the lead investigative agency, but uh, for every NTSB investigation, the FAA is always we call it a party or um, a team member on that investigation. So the FAA is always there, and then part two. It, whatever, if there's an airline involved, and of course with general aviation accidents, there's uh, many times not any sort of operator or airline involved, but um, if, there, if there is one, they would then be a party to that investigation and support, um, support the factual gathering of information. Uh, and we would all evaluate the information together as a team. And so um, that's a hallmark of an NTSB investigation although the NTSB does produce the analysis and cause independently, the facts are established together. And so specific to um, accident investigations, it's really, uh, we call it the party member process. Um, and you know, that, that language is really just a team. It's a, it's a team of uh, folks and, and the NTSB does that in large part because investigators, even though we may think we're experts on everything, we, we simply cannot be. Um, I, I don't know the ins and outs of the CRJ 900 uh, and in addition to the 787 so, uh, or experimental aircraft. So there's, um, the NTSB needs those resources in the industry uh, to, to, support, um, to support the investigations, produce, uh, produce something uh, to produce safety recommendations.
Sorry. And then from the FAA side, yeah, we, we, we participate in, uh, in, in pretty much every investigation. We have nine areas of responsibility that we have to um, determine if there is any responsibility or any, any involvement in. So it's uh, cert, uh, certifying the aircraft, the airmen, um, ATC, um, all those different aspects that go into um, what, 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 what keeps the aviation system going. Um, and then like, uh, like was like Adam was mentioning too, on the, the party system, um, the airlines, the pilots, everybody brings, uh, you know, kind of their expertise to the table because Adam hit it exactly right. They don't, you don't have the resources to, um, uh, you know, be a, uh, an expert or be as, as, um, up to speed as a line pilot, current line pilot would be, or say a flight attendant would be in the back, or um, someone um, uh, with the airline with their uh, with their SMS program or their maintenance programs. So it's it uh, it the process does work very well, and um, uh, like I said, if, if if you have an interest, um, by all means, there's there's lots of different different ways to to kind of get that experience and get and get involved. Thanks. Wanted to one of our airline. Representatives want to answer that? Yeah, um, we we work closely with both the FAA, obviously, and the NTSB. Uh, the NTSB, we partner with the Office of Aviation Safety. They offer to come and provide training for our GO team, um, the Transportation Disaster Assistance Organization, which helps respond uh, to the families and provide that assistance. Uh, are, we're partners with them. They provide training for our organization in Washington, D.C. So lots of, lots of interaction. Well, good. I just want to thank you guys so much for uh, joining us today. This has been a fascinating presentation. It's not often that you get to hear from different safety stakeholders in the industry at one time. So again, I know I learned a lot. I'm sure our attendees learned as much as well. So again, just thank you. We're so proud to have all of you as UND Aerospace alum and doing all the great things you're doing in the industry, especially uh, in the important world of safety. So again, thank you so much for joining us uh, for our career speaker series. And uh, again, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Thanks.